Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective, part eight of debunking the once saved, always saved film. Now, before we continue, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comments section below our comments. So welcome. We are analyzing and debunking the once saved, always saved documentary put out by Chris Hayes, I mean, Chris Wright. Uh, Chris Wright Ministries, where he assembled a group of scholars, theologians, and uh, apologists who hold to the view that once you're saved, you're not always saved. You're not guaranteed to be saved. You can lose your salvation, or you could give it back, or forfeit it, or walk away. And they are so uh, in a forceful way going out of the way to show you you are anything but guaranteed to get to heaven. And they actually even say that. There's no guarantee. And that you, you could lose your salvation um, if you don't fly right. So I want to do this. I want to show you one verse before we get into the video. We have been... Um, and I'm going to say, just again, as we do, um, analyzing what they say and then also comparing it in real time with the scriptures. And um, I just want to show you one verse of scripture here um, um, that, as I said here, this verse of scripture John 5, 24, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death into life. And what is interesting about this verse here, and I'm going to say this verse single-handedly debunks their argument against once saved, always saved. By the way, I would be in the camp of once saved, always saved. And just for the sake, because of the argument, the phrase that has been generated to use, once saved, always saved, and the idea is that what does it mean to be saved? Well, Jesus here in one sentence gives us what it means to be saved. And as we said before, if you notice here, he said, I assure you, okay? So that's the very first thing. They said, we're not guaranteed. Jesus says here, I assure you that if you hear his word, you believe. And then he tells us then three things that happens. First, you have eternal life. You're not going to get it. And some of the arguments we've seen that some of the brothers make here is that you're not guaranteed one even said, it's not over until it's over. But Jesus said, you have it, that, that right now you possess eternal life. You're not going to get it. You're not building it up. You're not generating it. He says, you have eternal life. The second thing he says is that you will not come under judgment. And notice, I assure you, you will not come under judgment. So now, if if a person believes, this is Jesus' statement here, you will not come under judgment. And then he says, and you have passed from death into life. That's a step. This is what you are when you believe. You have passed from death into life. Now, this is a list of the scriptures that they use. Most of them they cover, they cite during the video, and they cite this at the end of the video. And all of these videos that they cite, and it looks like a lot because it's over 50 video, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not videos, verses. It's over 50 verses that they cite that emphatically tells you that God will cut you off, right? And is that the message of the gospel that he gave? I just, just one sentence show you that it's simply not. Now, these verses, and one of the problems here is that these verses all 
all of them except for one verse, Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And they really focus on 23 because of the if you continue. But all of these verses except that verses are strung together from passages that do not deal with as the subject salvation. And that they never address any scriptures where the authors, Paul and John and other authors, Jesus, specifically teach on the subject of salvation. So that's amazing to me that you can string together an entire theology refuting God's claims, certainly dashing the hopes of people, putting fear and dread in the believers. Because why? <laughs> you better not. You better, God is a angry God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. See, that those positions are man-made um, ideologies. They make them up. And that's why I said you have to string all of these verses from passages that wasn't talking about salvation, that wasn't teaching on salvation. You know, who saves? How did he save? Who did he save? How can you get saved? And then we can throw in, how do you stay safe? Now, that one verse I just showed you in John 5, 24, John 5, 24, that one sentence where Jesus is teaching us, you notice they don't talk about that? And it's amazing because they will talk about verses all over the place, except, like, for example, uh, they talk about Hebrews 10, but won't talk about where he says uh, that Jesus, who has perfected, us with once and for all for his uh by the offering of his body uh colossians 1 that they don't even address they go to john but never go to john 3 14 through 19. they never go to galatians chapter 3. they never go to i mean romans 11 but they won't go to romans 3 4 and 5. it's amazing that these learned men, they, and they are, um, I'm most familiar with Dr. Brown. He knows these verses, which tells me then this is why they are disingenuous in their, they just want to, they want to believe something regardless of what scripture says, because when you have to, and they know these scriptures, if you have to just ignore these scriptures, where Jesus specifically talk about salvation where paul john specifically talk about salvation so they build their arguments these are theological arguments so they are arguments based upon men studying men studying men but not studying scripture and uh, why wouldn't you explain to us right why wouldn't you explain to us why what jesus said in john 5 24 does it mean what it means but all right Let's get to it. Let's get back to the video. Well, we're gonna to get to the video. And let me also say this before we actually get into it. As you can see, I am on Safari. And so I got these two programs running, these the scriptures, just the uh, online scripture. And so we're gonna be, and then I got the YouTube page up there. So my point of saying this is that because this this um, video garnered 131,000 views, and again, it, you know, since it, it, it so it it's got a nice number here, and it came out four months ago. So, um, so that's, so my point is that too, we're gonna get ads. That's my point. We're gonna get ads, and uh, um, so anyway, so let's get into it. So this is part three. And then they're gonna, it says counter arguments.
In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Those who believed in forms of once saved, always saved, will frequently point to Paul's words in Ephesians 1, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Greek, now let me just say this, we point to a lot more but you're going to probably single this out just to kind of make an argument, but I'm kind of intrigued to see what kind of argument they will make. Here we go. Seal is often, you know, a stamp, a seal of approval, a seal that a king puts on something that it belongs to him. Uh, and seals can be broken. Stamps can be effaced. Everybody <laughs> in Paul's world knew seals could be broken. There were seals on amphoras, wine jars, there were seals on documents. The same thing for the word earnest, which unfortunately... Let's stop for a moment, because again, this is so ridiculous. So if, if the seal could be broken, where does then God tell us the seal can be broken? You're making the argument, but the scriptures is not. And in some respects, you're perverting the plain reading of the scripture by adding this in here. This thought that doesn't exist is sometimes translated as guarantee. Well, guarantee. <laughs> Obviously, you have been guaranteed your salvation by the Holy Spirit, and that's the end of it. You're going to be saved. Well, translation is a tricky business. <laughs> Even the word. Let me just stop here because, see, when they start talking like this, if you're going to tell me, see, I'm not a Greek scholar. I studied the Greek. I have a whole arsenal of Greek here, but I'm not a Greek scholar. When I read, I don't really, if the trans, if you're telling me the translations are not good enough, then tell me, be honest enough to say, well, let's throw away the translation. And then what everybody should really do, what everybody should really do is learn the Greek language, become Greek scholars, so that we can now understand the Greek. Now, as I said, I have, uh, I'm not gonna reach up there, but I have, I have even a Greek translation. I, I, um, so, I mean, but I don't speak Greek. So, so, so then tell me the translation then, and they're gonna get into this, uh, again, false narrative by saying now, oh, we, we, because we don't understand the Greek, we need that Greek here. Well, then, let me just say this about the Greek, because obviously I'm not dis, dis, disparaging the Greek because, you know, God gave the revelation, the New Testament in Greek. But he also gave a universal revelation with universal language that can be translated into every language. Every language. John 3.16, which by the way, I don't know if they're ever going to get to talking about John 3.16, but John 3.16 pretty much is translated, it means the same if you go into the Greek. John 3.16 says the same thing, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish for that everlasting life. John 3.16 says the same thing in every language. So whether you study Greek, whether you translate it into Polish, whether you translate it into Brazilian, or you know, you know, whatever, you know, you think, well, it it, it it it's gonna come out, God loves us. So if you're gonna sit there and tell me now, you're gonna really go out of the way and say and have the gall to say that God is not guaranteed after he is guaranteed. Let me do this. Let me show you also why what, what, they're, what they're perverting. So let's kind of go there. Um, going to have to kind of calm down because it, it's, it's irritating to me when you have men's doctrine. And this is, this is the problem the doctrines of men. Um, but let me show you something. So I'm going to compare something here before we go back. All right, so in Ephesians 1, 
here's what here's what they which is interesting. Let me go back and look at let me read this here. So let me just kind of start reading and and just show you let's absorb what Paul is saying here. Because they're gonna go out of their way to tell you, no, 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 you're not remember that you're not guaranteed. Fear and tremble is what they're preaching. So verse one says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice the word grace, and then he says, and peace. Now, these are greetings, but the fact that he used these words, grace and peace to you from God. That's what comes from God, grace and peace to you. God's unmerited favor, right? God's unmerited favor, that's to you. Peace, and the word peace, and we see, we're not going to get into it here, but if you further down, go down further, especially in chapter 2, you see that Jesus is our peace. He is our peace. They're going to say, no, he's not. You are, you are the one that has to keep that peace. You're the one by good deeds, good works. You have to keep the peace. I, I'm kind of getting bothered because it is, they're going out of their way to discourage people. Anyway, and, and here's my point. Well, then let God discourage us. Don't twist the, the scriptures. Okay, let's go. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what comes from God. Grace and peace. We are at peace. Now, you remember Colossians 1, 22, that they um, really won't read? Uh, and I, I'm going to quote it. So Colossians 1, 22 says, um, um, in the, um, um, I don't know why my brain here is uh, freezing up. So let me quote it. I'm going to keep these scriptures up here. But let me... Um, let me quote it or read it. So um, once, this is Colossians 1, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions. So that's what we bring to the table. We were alienated and hostile by evil actions. Now they want to say that's, you could, you're almost, they're almost saying you could do this now. You, you're, you better be careful. But look at verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Now, I can say verse 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith. They're, they highlight the if here. But go back to verse 22. But he, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body, right? He presented us. Now watch this. He, ah, uh, let me do this here. I'm going to, because I, I unexpectedly, I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 3, because I want you to see this. Um, I should have done this at first, but, um, okay, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. So we could see this. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I lost it, huh? Uh, okay. That's not what I wanted. Okay, Colossians chapter one. All right. All right, because I want our eyes to see this because this is, these precious, wonderful truths, to me, they are perverting over a silly man-made doctrine. Okay, watch this. Once you were alienated and hostile in your mind because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you. He has reconciled you by his physical body through death. Notice he didn't say through your physical body. Body. Now, they're saying that they're preaching the reconciliation that you have to do. You're not guaranteed this unless you do something. He has reconciled you by his physical body 
through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. All right. Um, hmm. We're all over the place here. All right, let me go back because I want to do this side by side. Second Corinthians. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me go back. I'm just pulling it up now. Okay. So now, when he says grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let me stop here. Let me scroll down to uh, this is chapter two because I want you to see. When, when God uses the word peace, what does he mean? Verse 11 says, so then remember at, so remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcised by those called circumcised, which is done in the flesh with human hands. At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship, citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope, and without God in the world. Now, again, you will notice they don't preach this. They're not covering this. This is what God is telling us. Forget what, to me, you know, what they're preaching. They're going out of their way to preach. Don't rely on this. Don't have any confidence in what God is telling us here. You're not guaranteed. You, you better watch it. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. So again, notice what he's saying. Notice what he's building up on. We're brought near by the blood of the Messiah, not by our actions. For he is our peace. He is our peace. And the peace means to what? In hostility, what is causing rifts, what's calling, calling us to be separated, he said, he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put hostility to death by it. When the Messiah came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Now he didn't say, unless you do something, here's what you have to do. I got the peace, but here's what you have to bring to the table. Here's what you have to contribute. Because after all, there's no guarantee. Remember, the brother said that there's no guarantee. It's not over until it's over. He says it's over in Christ. He is our peace. For through him, we both have access by the Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Now, let me go back to verse two, because I, I wanted us to have that in our minds when he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this peace? This is from God. Now we know, because he, he tells us, right? But watch this, verse three. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavens. <clears throat> For he chose us in him <clears throat> before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, <clears throat> in love, <clears throat> in love, okay? So notice this, he chose us to be blameless in his sight. We already know in Colossians 1 how he, how he accomplished that. In the body of his, um, in, the body, in, in, in the body of his death, or in his body through his death, 
he presented us holy in his sight. Verse 5, he predestinated us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, that he favored us in the beloved. We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his what? Grace. Remember, grace and peace from God. Verse 8 that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven, things on earth in him. Verse 11, we also receive an inheritance in him, predestinated according to the purpose of of the one who works out everything in agreement with his decision of his will, so that we who already put our hope in the Messiah might bring praise uh, to his glory. Then he says, verse, th verse 13, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of the glory. So what is, now, so they're trying to make it seem like the guarantee is the salvation itself. That's not what Paul is talking about right here. The um, seal and the um, promise, you have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And he said, well, that, <laughs> that seal can be broken. Well, then why didn't he say that? Why didn't Paul say that? Why do these jokers have to say it? Okay. Now look at this, um, in 2 Corinthians, I'm going to pick it up at verse 5, chapter 5, chapter 5, okay? So watch this, <coughs> excuse me, I'll start reading in um, verse 16 of chapter 4, and then I'm going to go into chapter 5. <coughs> he said, therefore, do not give up. Even though our outer outer person outer person is being destroyed, <clears throat> our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction <clears throat> is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is not seen. But what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is not eternal. I mean is eternal. For we know that if our temporarily, we know that if, we know that if our temporary earthly dwelling is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this body, designed to be put on our dwelling from heaven. Since we have, uh, since we were clothed, we would not be found naked. Indeed, we groan. While we are in this tent, burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. Okay? So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, so we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident and satisfied to be out of the body and at home with the Lord. Now, the, the, so the Holy Spirit is the down payment, as it were. But notice, when, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, this is what changes our life. Okay, remember John 5, 24 says, we pass from death into life. What is disheartening about what these guys are saying is that, no, that doesn't mean that. In other words, the, the, the greatest error here is failing to say, here's what Jesus has done. Here is the effect of what Jesus has done, what Jesus produced. Now, the promise down payment, the earnest of down payment, uh, or the purpose um um, when he says here, the, the, the fact that we are changed by the Spirit, that's the down payment. But that means 
We have eternal life. We will not come into condemnation. We have eternal life. We've passed from death into life. What is yet to be promised is the changing of our bodies. Okay? So the earnest money here, when he says here, he gave us the Holy Spirit as down payment. He's using the illustration. Right? He's using the illustration. And by the way, he doesn't say that if we fail in certain, in whatever sense, that that Holy Spirit is going to be taken away. That we're not, we're no longer going to have eternal life. That we're no longer going to be born of the Spirit. Okay, let's go back. Let's... And T has more than one signification. But the word earnest is like earnest money. It means a down payment. So we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, meaning we have received the Holy Spirit as an inheritance, as a deposit on what is to come. If you think what God's done in your life so far is great, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Holy Spirit is just the, if you will, first installment of God's work in your life and where this is all going. Paul's... But stop, it also tells you what you are. See, understand that the Holy Spirit is what we, he, what he worked in us. We have eternal life. We are born of the Spirit. Okay? Um, Wonderful statement about the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a down payment, allows us to make a distinction between assurance and eternal security. About four times, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as the proof that we are saved. What is the evidence that you are a Christian? The work of the Holy Spirit in your life, changing your affections, changing your desires, making you able to live the life of Christ in ways that were simply never possible before the cross. We have powerful assurance for the internal working of the Holy Spirit. We don't need some kind of eternal security. We simply need reassurance. So that's the sealing of, by the Holy Spirit, that by receiving the Spirit, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And Romans 8, Galatians 4, God's put within us the Spirit of the Son saying, Abba, Father. So we have this deposit down payment. That's the seal of God saying, you're one of mine. You belong to me. I've given you my spirit. That's all it says. He, Yeah, that's all it says. Really? It says more than that. And it means more than that. To be able to say that you can cry, Abba, Father, means you are a child of God. This is a kind of unbelievable to me. Um... This is unbelievable to me um, what the arguments that they are making here. Um, <laughs> um, look at first John chapter three. This is I, I'm I am so um just flabbergasted that they are so bent on they're going to reverse what they're saying. But, you know, he, you, you, you talk about the assurance, but it's not eternal security. Well, what's the assurance then? Tell me what the insurance is. Because if the, because according to them, in a backhanded way, they're saying the assurance is you living right, you doing something to complete the action. And nowhere in Scripture that it tells us that we have the, even the capability of doing that. He is our peace. That's the assurance. He is our peace. That's the security. And by the way, earnest money, it was put up to show good faith. And if the one who put up the earnest money reneged, so for example, if you wanted to use the illustration here that they are trying to reverse Okay, by going to the Greek, if you wanted to say, <laughs> um, 
that the earnest money, he said, can be broken, right? They said that. Um, which is kind of backfiring on it because here's the problem here. Here's the problem. The one giving the earnest money is the one that is showing his good faith. So in a real estate deal, if I say I want to purchase your house, and you see this in what they call earnest money. So I put up 10% earnest money. I don't know if it's, got, it's not always got to be that high, but it's, I put up 10% earnest money because I'm telling you, I am I am interested in um, buying your house. Now, once I give that earnest money, the earnest money is non-refundable. The earnest money, <laughs> you know. So now, if I give that, if I give you the earnest money, because I'm telling you I want to buy your house, and you say, "Okay, good," I'm going to take the house off the market. Now, if I back out of the deal, if I back out of the deal, I still keep the earnest money. So that's how silly their argument is here. God is the one who gave us the Holy Spirit as the earnest. God is the one who gave us the, the earnest. So if God backs out of the deal, I keep the Holy Spirit. See how silly that is? So, so in other words, if God says, well, I'm gonna, I, I, don't, I don't want the deal anymore. I gave you the earnest money. I'm going to walk away. No. The earnest money is the one that assures uh, the, the, the seller of the deal. It's, it's crazy. But look at this verse here. First John chapter three says, look at how great a love the father has given us that we should be called God's children. Now I want to stop and look at it. Look at, look at what great love the father has given us. So the father has given us that we should be called, notice this, God's children. So now when you say, when you use the term children, father, children. He read the verse where it says, we cry out, Abba, Father. Now they want to tell us in a backhanded way that it really doesn't mean that he's actually your father. In other words, that's really what they're saying, that he doesn't really actually mean he's your father. He's kind of like, you know, really? Are you making that charge against God? So there's two things that, again, that's an error here. Not realizing this great love that the Father has given us, and also the effect of the love. Notice what he says. Look at how great love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. So we don't become children of God after the fact. Now remember, the blonde-haired brother, he says, you know, it's, you know, it's not over until it's over. And then Dr. Brown said, you don't have no guarantee. He says right here, he has given us, he has given us, right, this love that we should be called the children of God. Now watch this. And we are present tense. The reason the world does not know us because they didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed, but we know when he appears, Will we be like him for we, because we will see him as he is? But notice, go back to verse 2. Dear friends, we, we are God's children now. Now, you want to say is that God is kind of like winking, like, not really, not really, not really. You know, sometimes my, um, my granddaughter, her friends, they, they, they'll call us granddad, right? Or uh, Hey, granddad, grandma. We had one of the friends that was called. She was looking to get to the house and she called. She go, grandma, grandma, I'm looking to get to the house. Now, we both all know that you're really not our granddaughter, but you're our friend's granddaughter. You're really not. We know that. But when it comes to my actual grandchildren, my actual children, they are my actual children. <laughs> okay. All right not saying you can live any way you want 
in the meantime because you've been sealed. That would never be consistent with the teachings of Paul. Paul goes on to work. Again, that's not even the thought, though. Paul never introduced the thought. You keep inserting this in here that you can just live any kind of way. They're so fixated on that absurd observation right here, which no one teaches, by the way. But they're the ones that's keeping that. Uh, they're the ones that keep saying, you can live any kind of way. That, that, no, that we're teaching that you can live any kind of way and still be called children of God. Okay, no, we're saying the children of God is what the work of God does in us. We're in the church of Ephesus that they practice immorality and wicked sins. He gives a vice list. He says, no, for certain, don't let anyone deceive you, he says, because a lot of people are deceiving people on this. Let no one deceive you by vain words because of these things you will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. The same thing you have in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 about being sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have in Ephesians 4:30. But in Ephesians 4.30, it also says, not only are you sealed by the Spirit, but that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. So we be Grieve is not the same as being cut off. Yes, and this is what I'm saying. I don't want to grieve the Father. I don't want to stand before him and grieve. But again, being grieved is not being, well, I'm cutting you off. You're no longer my child. You no longer have eternal life. You are passed from life back into death still in the day of salvation, but then he warns us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And Paul is uh, taking a reference there from Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, when they were going into the promised land, but they grieved God's Holy Spirit and they became his enemies and he wiped many of them out. And so we have to be very clear that. So again, are we becoming enemies of God? You're quoting the scripture. And by the way, remember that before the promised land, the reason why they didn't go in the promised land was because of unbelief. Okay, that's the reason why they didn't go into the promised land, because of unbelief. Can do despite to the Spirit, like it says in Hebrews 10. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, that's uh, grieving away the means of our salvation. If the... No, he said we're grieving away the means of our salvation. So that means if we grieve the Holy Spirit. So now you got to go because y'all become hypocrites. What makes God, what, what grieves the Holy Spirit? Is there a list of sins or is there a measurement of sins right here? As I said before, if you go to almost any church and you say, okay, what are the sins that you let some of your Christian members in the church get away with? Now, obviously the big ones we know, adultery, fornication, you know, like murder. Okay, that might be too far for you guys. But what about being mean and honoring? Does that grieve God? And are you grieving? You know, how about those little sins right there, you know, that you that you kind of, even in yourself. How about the thoughts? You know, Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, in your, you know, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you, you've committed adultery in your heart. Are you grieving away the means of your salvation? So again, the means of our salvation is not that Jesus died on the cross for us, but the means of our salvation is how well we do not piss God off. If it troubles you this morning, thank God he's troubling you before you go to hell. The Spirit will leave you. Well, this is what you can do with the Holy Spirit. Accept Him, resist Him, grieve Him, quench Him. It's a shame so many people struggle with the most common teeth and gum problems when this simple 30-second bedtime warning... All right. All right. I think... What, um, let me see. Do I want to continue on here? I'll go on. No, you know what? I'm going to stop it here. I'll pick it up with John uh, chapter 10 next time. Um, Yeah, I, you know, listen to them. It kind of got me fired up this time because, I mean, you know, um, this is man's religion that we, this is, this is the epitome of man's religion's and then man's tradition. 
that Jesus himself actually criticized man's traditions. And either the, you, 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 like when the guy, the brother said, and actually said, that you can grieve away the means of your salvation. So that means then you, you better give us uh, the full list of how do I grieve away the means of my salvation. In other words, here is Jesus dying on the cross, and I can grieve that away. I can grieve it away the way the cross doesn't matter. So and, 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 and so really to you, the cross never mattered because really it's what, okay, I, I, I'm going to, you know, can see that you're saying that, yeah, Jesus, it was necessary that Jesus died on the cross. But basically what they're really teaching is that it's more necessary for what I do and don't do. It's more necessary that I don't do certain things because I could grieve away. I could break the deal, even though God is the one who's given, given us to earn his money. But I could do something that can break the deal. See, so, so again, man's effort human effort, that I have to do all this to get to God. And by the way, which they, they kind of butcher the scriptures where they actually tell us we, we really don't have him, that we really don't have God yet. We got to do some things first. We got we to gotta show some things, prove some things first before we can actually say <laughs> or get eternal life even though God said we already have it. See, that's what I'm saying. The problem is that all of these scriptures, and, and, and again, I, I have to admit, Ephesians 1, they just butchered that. They butchered that. But I am surprised that they, 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 they read it. So I'm going to have to revise. They don't, I'm going to see most of these scriptures here. Let me see if, if if Ephesians 1 is in this list here of Scripture. It didn't matter because if you think about it, they butchered it horribly. They butchered it. And if, and if we could grieve the Holy Spirit to the point, as they're saying here, if we could break the deal, the earnest money, then Paul should have put an addendum to that and said it, but he didn't. We will continue this in the next study, guys, and we're going to continue analyzing and debunking the one saved, always saved, um, the arguments against it. And as we see, one of the ways that we are refuting their argument is by showing you what God actually said, which the scriptures that for the most part they did. Now, I was surprised by Ephesians 1, though. Because see that uh, that th think about that Ephesians one tells us what salvation is about. They have to cut in there and add, but you can break it. Okay, anyway, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome, and I do mean that. All comments are welcome, and let me do a challenge too in your comments. Refute the scriptures that I provide. All right, guys, I'll see you in part. What part am I doing here? Part number 10 next time, I believe it is, right? All right, see you next time.